All right, so uh, what we're going to do today is I'll say a few things about this website, cloud.sagemap.org, in case you want to try it out. Uh, then we're going to talk about, we'll finish talking about inverses of matrices, and then we'll start talking about uh, linear independence. Uh, but first, are there any questions about anything related to the course? Okay. Okay, so first, uh, I posted a website called cloud.sagemath.org, which I spent the last eight months writing. And I uh, only made it available a day or two ago. And it should be loaded with bugs, have all kinds of missing features. But it should be functional enough that you can take the worksheets that I'm showing you in class and use them. So look at them, change the numbers, etc. cetera. Um, this is the URL. Notice that there's an S right here. If you type this without an S, you'll just get a page not found error because I haven't got around to implementing the redirect automatically to the secure version of this, which is not my top priority. Um, this is what the site looks like when you go to it. And you can then make an account. Notice there's a hopefully terrifying warning. Um, it says it will randomly delete anything you post here, possibly without warning. I don't actually intend to ever delete anything. And I'm kind of a clutter person when it comes to data. So even if I reset the site, I will have kept a complete copy of everything. Uh, and it's pretty easy to just download files that you edit here to your computer. There's a little link that you can click. Yes? Uh, does it cost money? No, it's completely free. Uh, at some point in the next month or two, I'm going to make it so that you uh, are encouraged, so that people are encouraged to donate money to the university uh, if they use this, but that will be completely optional. And in general, Sage, the software I'm using, that's free. And uh, it's a, Sage is, by the way, this, here's the website for Sage. If you just type Sage in Google, you'll find this, um, sagemap.org. This website is uh, hosted in the math department here, across the, like right over there. And um, this is an open source project I started about seven or eight years ago. And this is free and will always be completely free. Uh, and you can download it, you can use it online in various ways, etc. And this is the software that's kind of doing a lot of the work behind the scenes for uh, various things like linear algebra when I show you things. Okay, so if you go here, you can say, uh, you can try to log in if you don't have an account yet, and it'll just give you an error because you don't have an account. You just say create an account, and then you can say uh, Joe Blow. <laughs> uh, I'll say it that way so it doesn't have a drug reference. Um, and then W Stein plus. If you want to have multiple accounts with the same email address, this is a trick for pretty much any website. You can say your give your normal email, but right after the name, put plus and then a number, and it will completely. You can have many, many different uh, accounts with the same email address. Uh, so if you do wstein plus 7, for example, at gmail.com, that will go to the exact same place as wstein plus 8. They all go to wstein at gmail.com, but they're different. So you can use them as different logins to the same website. This is generally a good thing to know about. Uh, so I'll just use some random number. And then here you can choose a password. So if you do something that's really weak, it'll be weak, but... Um, do something a little stronger. Uh, this password checker is just one that Dropbox makes available as an open source password strength checker. And you have to agree to some terrifying but very short terms of usage. This is the short version. This is the long version. Um, and then you just click create an account. And now you have an account. And then you can click uh, create a new project and give it some title. But you can trivially change it later. So just make something up like that. Um, you might have to wait about 10 seconds for it to create the new project, although usually it'll be in completely instantaneous. Um, it caches some number of pre-created ones and then allocates them. And it was the first one that's been created since I restarted the server. But if I created another one, it would be much quicker. Um, then you click there, and there are a couple of tabs across the top, files, recent, new, etc. Um, probably the one that you'll find most useful is new. 
If you click there, then you can uh, create a new file by typing the name here. You can either make a file, a worksheet, a command line prompt, or a directory. You can also drag and drop any files right here, and then they'll just be available. And you can also paste in a link from the web here, and then click and it'll grab that link, whatever is at that place on the web. So an example of where you might find something on the web is the worksheets that I've been posting. So if we go to the uh, website for course, uh, whoops, wrong website, wrong course, uh, sorry. So 308, and then go to lectures, and then uh, the first few, uh, I probably changed the format so they might not work, but let's take, uh, say, today's lecture. So here it is. This is in GitHub, and you can't just paste, right now you can't just paste in this link, because if you were to grab the contents of that URL, you're going to get all this other HTML that surrounds the actual content that you want. That will change in that I'll make it aware that you're not looking at the raw version at some point in the future. Right now you just have to click on raw to get the actual raw file. And then you take this link, copy it, and then paste it right here. Alternatively, you could download the file and just drag and drop it into that box and then it would upload it. So now you click copy into my project, it downloaded it, and if you look at files now, you'll see that there's a new file there which you can click on, uh, and then that gives you the worksheet, which you can now see. And that's today's lecture. And here you can go through and change anything. The way you evaluate something after you change it is you hit Shift-Enter right now. Um, and the result of hitting Shift-Enter is that number just got changed. Okay. And that's pretty much everything you need to know to play around with uh, these worksheets. And as you can see, you'll have a bunch of files that you'll start accumulating here. Um, you can delete them by just, if you put the mouse over it, something appears where you can click on a trash. You can download a file by clicking on the green button. So if you modify it and want to save it, you can download it that way, uh, et cetera. And you can drag files around and drop them in uh, other folders if you make folders. Okay. And there's very little help. There's just a big scary warning and absolutely no hope at all right now. So you'll just have to talk to me if you have questions about how to use this. All right, so that's the first thing. Any questions? Um, also, the user interface, uh, there's this thing called responsive web design where you make things reflow really nicely on different sized devices, which I was using for a while and which I temporarily disabled. So this doesn't look very good on like an iPhone or an Android phone. Uh, it looks okay on an iPad, but uh, don't expect it to work really well on those devices. Um, so it's not so bad on iPads. I really like using things on my iPads. So. All right, so I'll consider this done for now. When you try it out later, it should give you some help. Um, and by the way, when I uh, hopefully write something to compete with WebAssign, it would be part of this system. You would log in with an account here, and maybe there, I don't even know what the user interface will be like, but maybe you'll have an extra tab or something here, which is homework assignments that you're supposed to do. You would do them in here, click a button, and get feedback, and I would get the scores aggregated somewhere. Um, if you have any ideas about what the user interface should be like from within here to do homework, please let me know after you've tried this out, because I haven't thought about it very much. All right, so that's the first thing. Now on to inverses. So click here for full screen. And make the font bigger and bigger and bigger. Let's see, so here we are. Hmm. It's better than it does. That looks terrible. Okay, there it looks a lot better. All right, so remember at the end last time, we talked about the inverse of a matrix. You have a matrix A, such as, for example, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then we considered a notion of the inverse of a matrix, which is another matrix with the property that A times B equals B times A 
equals the identity. And I left you with the question, does this matrix have an inverse? And uh, what is the answer? Does it or does it not? Nope. Does anyone think it does? So anybody, and so a couple of people think it doesn't? If you think it doesn't, you're right. This matrix does not have an inverse. There are no matrices B with the property that A times B is the identity. Uh, let's see why that is the case. So this matrix has no inverse. This matrix is not invertible. So we'll see in a moment why that's the case. But that's what I left you with last time. So um, the next thing I'll tell you is how to find the inverse of a matrix, if it has one, or if it doesn't, how to see that there definitely is no inverse to a matrix. Okay? So I'll give you an algorithm right now. It's a way that you can decide one way or the other. So this is uh, a way to decide if A is invertible, that is, has an inverse. And moreover, you get an inverse. It's a pretty straightforward process. It's tedious to carry out by hand, but it's good to understand what it is and how it works. And we'll see what it tells us in this particular case. Um, so what you do is step one is you create the matrix. So consider the augmented matrix that you get by just taking the matrix A you're interested in, and then right next to it, putting the identity matrix. So in the case of this one right here, we would make the following matrix. So our matrix A, and then right next to it, we'll put the identity matrix of the appropriate size. Okay, that's step one. You just simply form that matrix. It will have n rows and two n columns. <coughs> okay, step two, put it in reduced row echelon form. Find the unique matrix in reduced row echelon form that's equivalent to this matrix. So compute the reduced row echelon form of AI. And let's, let's call the resulting matrix, uh, E, F. By this I mean that it's another matrix that uh, has uh, n rows and two n columns, and I'm just going to call the first matrix E, the first n by n part of it, E, and the other part F, just so I can refer to it in step three, that's all. Okay, let's do that with this particular example. Probably uh, you don't want to see me do the entire process of putting this in reduced for echelon form. And I sure don't want to do it. So uh, we'll do it with this program right now. <coughs> so here's how you do that. You do um, matrix, and it has three rows, six columns, and the entries are 1, 2, 3, then 1, 0, 0, then Four, five, six. You just give the rows like that. Four, five, six, and then zero, one, zero, and then seven, eight, nine, zero, zero, one. So that's our matrix, which I'll call A. Actually, it's not A. It's kind of AI. So I'll write AI. And then, uh, whoops. Oh. AI dot RREF, that's reduced row echelon form. There it is. See, it just gives it to you. So that's what I type. And that's the result. Um, and by the way, when I edit these worksheets, they get uh, somewhat shortly, they get automatically pushed out to the GitHub page. So it's not like you won't see this change when you look at them later. 
Okay, so uh, the resulting rho echelon form, or reduced rho echelon form, is 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 0, 0, 0. And then over here we have some other stuff. 0 minus 8 thirds. It's kind of a mess. 5 thirds. <coughs> 0, 7 thirds. Minus 4 thirds. 1, minus 2, 1. Okay, and now three, step three. Your matrix A is invertible if, when you look at the reduced row echelon form, the matrix out here that I've called E is the identity matrix. And in that case, F will be the inverse. So, um, so in terms of the words that I'm writing here, three, step three would be uh, A is invertible exactly when E is the identity matrix, and then the inverse of A is just F. Okay? So that's the part where um, you need some argument to see why that should be right, which is uh, what I'll give you. In this particular example, notice that our matrix on the left is not the identity matrix, and therefore, according to what I claimed over there, A is not invertible. This matrix A right here is not invertible. In terms of solving systems of equations, finding the inverse of a matrix A is exactly the same as solving the system AX equals 1, 0, 0, AX equals 0, 1, 0, and AX equals 0, 0, 1. If you were to do that with this particular matrix A, uh, what we see here is that if you did the process of trying to solve for 1, 0, 0, you'd end up with this uh, four column by three row matrix. It's in, the system's inconsistent because you get 0 equals 1 as the bottom equation. So there's no solution already, and therefore there can't possibly be an inverse. Likewise, if you tried to solve for AX equal to 0, 1, 0, you'd end up with this as the last column of your <coughs> reduced row echelon augmented matrix. And again, because you have a non-zero entry here and zero there, all along there, there can't be a solution. And even worse, if you tried to solve for AX equal to zero, zero, one, you'd end up with this as the last column, and this as the, right there, so you'd end up with zero equals one again. So in fact, none of the um, vectors of, none of the Bs that are one, zero, 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 one, zero, and zero, zero, one, none of those have the property that AX equal to that has a solution. And so there's just no possible way that A is invertible. Okay. Let's slightly change A to, I don't know, if somebody yell out another integer besides 9. 13 was the first one I heard. Let's see if this one is invertible. And what I'll do is, in the program, I'll just type, I'll change the 9 to a 13, and then reevaluate. That's what we got back. So in case you can't see the screen, it has the identity matrix and then a bunch of crap on the right. So a bunch of big numbers on the right. What this tells us is what? Is it invertible or not? Yes, it's invertible. And what is the inverse? It's all that stuff on the right. Okay, so there you are. You now know how to find the inverse and how to decide whether or not a matrix is invertible. And the key thing that you know, goes on behind the scenes is you have to compute this reduced row echelon point. That's it. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Take any random matrix, it's invertible. It's kind of 100% probability. The, um, there's a number associated to a square matrix called the determinant. It's just given a matrix, a number pops out, there's a formula for it called the determinant. It's an algebraic function of all the numbers in the matrix. We will talk about it in some detail. Um, I'll get to your question in a second. That number is non-zero, if and only if the matrix is invertible. And if you imagine a uh, three-dimensional space, for example, the prop, the constraint, well, actually, sorry, if you imagine three by three matrices, they sit in a nine-dimensional space, because there's nine possible parameters, and the determinant cuts out some condition. So basically, uh, if you imagine the room, and then you imagine some plane that kind of moves through the room, then 
the matrices that are not invertible are the ones that sit on that plane. And so if you take a random point in the room, you're very unlikely to, find, to hit one that actually lays on this perfectly um, thin plane. So that's, I mean, technically that is a reason why 100% of matrices are invertible. So randomly, you just choose a matrix at random, it's going to be invertible. However, often, in practice, you run into matrices that aren't invertible because it's very rare that you actually choose anything truly at random that you're interested in. If you're interested in it, then it's not random, probably. Um, still, it's good to keep that question in mind. I think there's another question in the back and then your question. Is there another question in the back or comment? Nope, okay, your question. Yeah. That's right. Just because there's a 100% chance doesn't mean every single thing satisfies it. It's an infinite set of matrices. So uh, it's kind of a measure theoretic statement. Like, um, if you have a perfectly flat plane in three-dimensional space and it's infinitely thin, so it's just a plane, then 100% of points don't lie on it. Because if you take, uh, if you take a kind of random sampling, then every once in a while you might find a point that lies on it, but in the limit, the number that lie on it is zero percent. Um, so like the, the measure, the, uh, here's one, so how many number, what proportion of all integers are perfect squares? <coughs> So it's an infinite set. All the all whole numbers are an infinite set, and so if you if you fix uh, say the numbers from zero up to a hundred, zero, one, two, all the way up to a hundred, roughly I don't know that's not a hundred. Uh, roughly ten percent of them are perfect squares, right? But then what if you look at the numbers up to a bigger value, like uh, say a million? W roughly how many numbers up to a million are perfect squares? A thousand, yeah, square root of a million, or r roughly a thousand. And what percentage of a million is a thousand, roughly? You could say really, really small. You give the actual percentage, but <coughs> really, really small. It's like it's one thousand divided by a million, and then you know you can worry about the decimal, but um, it's less than one percent. It's like a tenth of a percent. So one one thousand. So up to um, so one tenth of the numbers up to a hundred are perfect squares. One one thousandth of the numbers up to a million are perfect squares. And if you were to ask the question, what percentage of numbers amongst all numbers are perfect squares? A reasonable answer would be zero percent. Simply because in the limit, as you look at larger and larger ranges of numbers, the proportion that are perfect squares goes to zero. Okay? And you can get much more complicated than that. Anyways, yes? Um, so for, for any particular cutoff point, it actually is not zero, but if I were, I mean, the only, I think the only meaningful uh, way to interpret a phrase like the proportion of perfect squares amongst all positive numbers, all positive whole numbers, is zero percent would be that it means that as you take, it means that the limit of the proportions goes to zero or converges to zero. Uh, any questions? Yes? So then that's, uh, that just kind of referring to that there's an infinite amount of uh, matrices. matrices. Absolutely, yes. To bring that back to this discussion, there are infinitely many matrices. So if you look at all, for example, two by two matrices, three by three matrices, whatever, there are infinitely many of them. And of those infinitely many matrices, if you consider all the matrices where the entries are at most 10, say, something like that, then some of them do have to do have some of them are invertible and some of them aren't, and maybe a lot of them are not invertible. But if you make the entries bigger and bigger, then the proportion that fail to be invertible goes to zero. And so, in the limit, 100% of the matrices are invertible. Okay, so that's it. Um, the reason for this, again, is that finding the inverse is exactly the same as solving AX equal to 100, 010, and 001. And that's exactly what you're doing 
if you understand how to solve a system of linear equations using reduced rational form, that's exactly what this algorithm is doing. It's doing no more or less than exactly that. I've just encoded that problem in terms of, in a nice, simple to describe term. You take AI, put it in reduced rational form, you either get the identity and the inverse matrix, or you prove that your matrix is not invertible. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay, next, uh, I'll just do a little bit of practice with the idea of invertible matrices before we move on to independence of vectors. So, um, this is a theoretical statement with a lot of text, but let's just think about it for a little while. Don't worry too much about what's up there. I'm going to make a claim. And we'll see if you believe it or not. A is invertible. If and only if, so I'll just write an arrow in each direction. For a matrix to be invertible is exactly the same as um, the equation AX equal to B having a unique solution for every possible value of B. This is for a square matrix. So this has, this has a unique solution for all B. So you can see how understanding the idea of an invertible matrix, assuming this were actually true, and it is, uh, would be relevant to understanding systems of equations. If the A, the matrix A, in your system of equations is invertible, then there will definitely be a solution, and it's unique. On the other hand, if you find, if you try to solve a system of equations, and you find that for any B at all that you try to do this for, that you get one solution, then you know that the same will be the case for any other B that you try to use. So again, that seems like a good thing to understand, right? Uh, it's pretty powerful. So, let's just see if you believe this. Uh, why do I think this is true? Well, there's two, the arrow here means that if this is true about a matrix, then that will be true about the systems that you have over here, about these equations. Conversely, completely different statement. If this is true, namely that AX equal to B always has a unique solution, then it must be the case that A has to be invertible. So when you write this, you're writing two statements. There's one in one direction and one in the other. So first, um, Let's consider this direction. By this I mean the statement that if A is invertible, then this always has a unique solution. This is very easy to see algebraically. Watch. Um, we're assuming that A is invertible, and you just consider an equation like this. All you do is just multiply both sides by A inverse. Um, and you get another equation, namely A inverse A x equals A inverse B. But you can cancel here. This, this product is the identity. So this just says that x is equal to a inverse b. And this is a solution to that. It's the only solution to that equation. If you have an x that satisfies this equation, then it must, if it satisfies ax equal to b, then it must satisfy x equals a inverse b. So there's, a, there's at most one solution. But this one works. You just plug it in. A a inverse B, and you find by reassociating this as A, A inverse times B, the identity times B, B. So you just take that value of X. So there exists a unique solution. If a matrix is invertible, then when you consider AX equal to B, you find that that system must have a unique solution. And going back to our 100% of square matrices are invertible remark, that means that for a random a system of linear equations in n variables, and you have n equations, there's going to be a unique solution. This is a nice thing to know. So that's one direction. Does this make sense? Any questions about this? Please ask. Yeah. Actually, I won't show you the next direction unless you ask a question. Yeah? 
discuss anything related to this. Yes? So is this the um, if part, or are you only in part? Let's see what English says to us. So I'm going to read this. A is invertible if, I'm just going to delete that part. A is invertible if this always has a unique solution. And then I could delete the if part. A is invertible only if this has a unique solution. English isn't very helpful. <laughs> um, I don't, yeah, really funny. Yeah. It's really not clear from English, English, which says that. I mean, I know what if and only if means. It means both directions. But I don't, I don't really, yeah, I don't know. I mean, he wants to know if it's the if or the only if part. I mean, I never, I never would write. Now we, we do the if part and then the only if part. I just write the arrows because it's so much clearer, right? It's clear what this means. This means this truth implies that truth. Yes? Um, so if one half of A, if it's the same, if one half of A and the other side is B, okay. so if you're uh, saying A, using the same letter, if, let's use different letters, like okay, uh, sorry. Right. this side is uh, uh, alpha, alpha okay. and this side beta. So if it, it would then be alpha, like if alpha is true, then beta, beta means if beta, then alpha, and then alpha <laughs> only wait, wait. if beta means Alpha, if alpha, then beta. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, that only made sense in my head. Sorry. <laughs> it probably made sense. Yes. Uh, well, alpha, if alpha, then beta, and is the if part, and only if part is if beta, then alpha. Okay, so because people tend to agree that we just did the if part. Yeah. Right? Okay. I honestly don't think of it that way at all. Like, I don't think of there being an if part and an only if part. I just immediately convert it to an implication in one direction or the other. But I'm fine with an interpretation like this. So what we just did was, if statement alpha is true, then statement beta is true. So alpha implies beta. Right, that's actually the really easy part. Oh, yes? Yeah, well, for if and only if it doesn't really matter because... Yeah. Yes. That's probably why I never worry about that. We're just yeah. trying to break up the Yep. Yep. Okay. Let's uh, see if we can uh, be convinced of the other direction, which is that if beta is true, well, then alpha is true. That is, if you always have a unique solution then the matrix is invertible. Any ideas how to prove that? You have some matrix, and you find that no matter what B you plug in to this system, or to this equation, you always find a solution X. And in fact, it's unique, but maybe you don't even need that. Part. Any idea why that would imply that A has to be invertible? Pretty sure you can figure this out. Okay, simple algebra. If that were your answer in a <laughs> problem, I might not give you credit for that. Don't be too far, it's just why. Like, why in the heck would it be? So remember how we found the inverse. What, remember the algorithm I just explained. What you're doing in finding the inverse. Yes? Well, maybe there's, I'm not quite convinced by that because uh, one way you can find the inverse, the, one way you can find a solution is using the inverse, but why does knowing that there's always a solution imply that there has to be an inverse? Uh, yes. Very good. So, I sort of follow what you're saying. Basically, you're, you're, so remember in my algorithm, I start with A and I, 
And I want to find the inverse of A. So I want to find um, solutions to AX equal to 1, 0, 0. I mean, in general, there's N of them. AX equal to 0, 1, 0. And AX equal to 0, 0, 1. So that's what you would need to do in order to find the inverse. Because after all, if B is the inverse, and it has columns, say, B1, B2, B3, and this is equal to the identity matrix, then this product, remember multiplying a matrix times another matrix is exactly the same as applying the matrix to each of the columns. So finding a matrix B so that A times B is the identity, that's exactly the same as solving A times something equals 1, 0, 0, A times something equals 0, 1, 0, and A times something equals 0, 0, 1. Can I do that under this hypothesis? If I assume that AX equal to B always has a solution, a unique solution, can I solve AX equal to 1, 0, 0? What do you think? Say yes if you think so. Yeah, because I mean it's just a special case of this. And the unique doesn't even matter. All that I'm using is, if you, I mean you could just take B equal to 1, 0, 0. And I'm assuming that there is a unique solution. Therefore there's a solution. So you can find the first column of the inverse matrix. Same for the second column, same for the third column, etc. So definitely this implies that there's an inverse. It gives you something that easily allows you to produce the inverse. All right, so these are equivalent statements in both directions. So here we are. Um, there's almost nothing left that I need to tell you about inverses. There's two little algebraic identities that are surprisingly easy to verify. And then we'll move on to considering um, linear independence of vectors, which is a whole new topic and which will be kind of the, probably the central thing in the course. Not probably this. Or at least things involving linear independence of vectors. So let's just uh, look at these two identities. Uh, they're just, they're very, they're almost, they're actually exactly the same as the ones we have for transposes, except they're way easier to prove than the ones for transposes. So here's what they are. A inverse inverse is A, and A B inverse is B inverse A inverse. Okay, these two things are true. Or if you take two matrices that are n by n matrices and for which the inverses exist, then the inverse of the inverse is the original matrix, and the inverse of A times B is B inverse times A inverse, the order switches, okay? And I'll prove uh, both of these statements to you in about two lines of what looks like very easy and believable algebra. It's much, much easier than what we do with the transpose. Okay? That's good. So this is easy. All I have to do to... The inverse is the matrix that's characterized by the property that when you multiply it by the matrix it's supposed to be the inverse of, you get the identity matrix. So let's just check to see whether these matrices have the right properties. So, in order to check that something that I claim is the inverse of A is actually the inverse of A, all I have to do, or actually, let's see, what am I claiming here? I'm claiming that the inverse of A inverse is A. That's what this statement is. So let's check it. So, what I have to do is take A and just multiply it by what I claim is the inverse of uh, wait, hold on. I'm getting confused. Okay, so here's a matrix, A inverse, and I claim that a formula for the inverse of A inverse is A. That's what this says. This is the statement, the inverse of A inverse is A. So all I'm going to do is just check to see if it works. I will multiply A inverse by A. Do I get the identity? Of course. So I've just proved that the inverse of A inverse is A. Because it works. Yes? So, if you use the second line right there, mm -hmm. if you get the inverse of A to the inverse, or the inverse of A to the inverse, mm -hmm. that's yep. kind of like the inverse of the inverse of A times the identity, right? Uh, I didn't quite follow that. I, maybe the use of what would help 
Mm -hmm. Are you trying to prove the second thing right now? Okay, go for it. Um, although this is probably very long. But okay, so it's okay. Wouldn't it be, couldn't you do the inverse of then if, it's, if the inverse of AB is the inverse of A, then would it be like the inverse of the inverse of A times B? It wouldn't no. be identity. It would be identity. Something like that. Let's see if we can just figure out exactly what this says. Okay. <laughs> and then we'll see whether what you're doing basically works. So what does this say? It says that it says that it's a formula for the inverse of some matrix. What matrix is it a formula for the inverse of? So yell out a matrix. What matrix am I claiming I can give a formula for the inverse of it? Somewhere near my finger. A times B, exactly. So right there it's a a claim that we have a formula for the inverse of A times B. That is, there's something I'm supposed to be able to put here and get the identity. Okay, so here's our matrix. And right there, this is a claim that its inverse is given by some formula. What is the formula? What should I write here? What am I claiming that the inverse of this is? of matrix. That would be true. Um, this is certainly true. However, that's not the interesting part of what's being claimed here. So I'm going to erase this. Can I put something else here? That's more interesting. Yes, B inverse times A inverse. Okay, so this statement, what's claimed here is that if you take A times B and multiply it by B inverse A inverse, you get the identity. Does that seem at all plausible? Should, because um, to prove this, all you have to do is do a little algebra. You just change where the parentheses are, which you can do since matrix multiplication is associative. And now this is B times B inverse, which is the identity. So I can write this as A times the identity times A inverse. But if you multiply any matrix by the identity, you just get that matrix back again. So I can write this as A times A inverse, which is just the identity matrix. Okay? And so in fact, this is equal to the identity. Yes? Exactly. The identity matrix, that is the matrix with ones down the diagonal, has the property that when you multiply it by any other matrix, you get back that matrix. And you should check that for yourself, but I mean, it's, that's how the algebra works. It's just, if you take one, it's kind of a special case here, but what happens if you multiply this by some, by any matrix at all? Let's think about what happens. That's GH pi. When you just start writing down the answer, you take one, zero, zero, and multiply it by this matrix. You're going to, the, the bottom two rows won't matter. You're just taking one, zero, zero and dotting it. You get ABC across the top again. And then if you do 0, 1, 0 times that matrix, you get DEF. And then if you do 0, 0, 1 over this way, you get GHI. So it just turns out that the identity matrix is the unique matrix, in fact, with the property that you can multiply it on either side, any square matrix, and you get back that matrix. Okay? And there's an identity matrix, one for each size N. All right, so that uh, concludes inverses of matrices. Any questions? Yes? There's a formula for the inverse. It's true. Um, yeah, it is kind of handy in practice. It's just, I mean, it's just a formula. It only works for two by two. No, actually, there's formulas in general. Um, here's how you can derive the formula in the book. Take that matrix with four variables called A, B, C, D, and just compute the reduced row echelon form by doing row operations. The algebra gets a little messy, but you'll end up with the identity matrix and then the uh, matrix of interest. In fact, just for fun, I can literally do that here. Um, I'll make four indeterminates A, B, C, D. I'll make the matrix that's two by two with, actually it's two rows and four columns, and the entries are A, B, one zero, 
and then c comma d zero one. And I hope I can do this. I'm kind of scared I can't, but we'll see. There it is. That's the one. That's the formula in the book. Although in the book they factor out the common coefficient. Let me. I do show and it'll typeset it nicely. So uh, it's kind of ugly, but that is the general formula for the inverse. Although, God, that's hard to look at. Um, <laughs> I mean, what it really looks like is so it's the identity, and then the formula I have over here is, well, for the inverse is, it's 1 over AD minus BC, D, A minus B minus C, if I remember correctly. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, that's right. Uh, I have used, the, so I memorized this at some point in my life. I must have used it a thousand times, probably. So in fact, it is very useful to have a formula memorized for the inverse of a two by two matrix. In my research in number theory, I uh, very, very, very often work with explicit or not explicit two by two matrices because um, they represent certain things called linear fractional transformations on the upper half plane. And um, this formula, you constantly end up using it. And you can easily see that it, it works because if you just multiply Back again, you get AD minus BC as the first upper left entry, and then that cancels with the AD minus BC there, so you end up with a 1 in the upper left. Same thing exactly in the lower right. And then the other two, you end up with just quickly, you get 0. CD minus CD. So you get 0 for the off-diagonal entries. So this particular formula works for 2 by 2 matrices. You could write down a similar formula that would be much uglier for 3 by 3 matrices. I've never actually done that. Um, by the way, this number right here is called the determinant of the matrix, which I had mentioned a few minutes ago. And if you choose random numbers A, B, C, and D, it's pretty unlikely that AD is equal to B times C. But it could happen. Yes? That's correct. If AD, this, a 2 by 2 matrix has an inverse if and only if AD minus BC is non-zero. If only if this denominator works. So um, AD minus BC not equal to zero is exactly the same as your matrix has an inverse. And it's in fact in general the case that this determinant will tell us whether or not it determines whether or not a matrix has an inverse. Uh, this is gonna we'll start with this next time, so it's really an entirely new topic. Okay, any other questions? All right, let's stop uh, two or three minutes early, and I'll see everybody on Monday. Um, this is for you. I don't know, have you gotten one of those before? Are you eating? It's the Philly Resource Center. Thing. Oh, I have never got one. Ah, well. But let me know what you need to do. I'll go. Yeah, um, it's pretty much there. Is it longer exams or something? Else? Yeah, that's it's basically that. It's like also like if I start beeping in the middle of class or something. Or beeping? Like beeping. I sometimes beep. Um, it's oh. not out of rudeness. It's just oh. like sometimes. Okay. Oh, cool. um, or like eat or something like that. It's mostly just you know stuff like that, so that you know, like I'm not trying to be rude. Excellent. Thank you for leaving us, yeah. and I'll read it. Sorry.